Her father was a Vietnamese kingpin who married her teenage Chinese mother. Her childhood was exposed to Chinese Vietnamese gang violence when Felicia He's father became an escaped convict and on the lam, he took her with him. Today, she is a critical care anesthesiologist and the mother of four. She met her husband in medical school, who she eloped with on a South African safari. With a bottle of wine and a laptop, she isolated herself in a studio to write her book, Spirit of a Honey Hummingbird, Memories from a Childhood on the Run. Please welcome Felicia Heath. Thank you for having me, Debbie. So what is your earliest memory of your father and your mother? My earliest memory is how I actually opened the book. It is when there is an instance where my mother tries to escape my father. Mm -hmm. She had been with him for about three or so years. She had been exposed to what he was actually doing uh, and she thought she was in danger. So my earliest memory is her coming home, packing our stuff and getting us to leave in a hurry without me understanding much at that age and arriving at her previous adopted parents' house in the middle of the night, seeking help, getting denied, unfortunately, and then going back to my father. Mm. What was that like? It was scary. It was confusing. And it was extremely difficult. I think a very difficult decision on her part and our behalf, but there didn't seem like there were many good options at that time. My father was extremely physically and verbally abusive, and this really enraged him that she tried to leave without him knowing and take advantage of him not being around and trying to escape that lifestyle. Wow. So how notorious was he? You mentioned he's a kingpin, so obviously that's the top of the food chain in the crime market. But right. how how wide was his reach? How notorious was he? His reach is, I think, underestimated. He came to America, worked for a very, you know, well-known organized crime leader at the time, Stephen C. from the Ping Long Triad in Boston. Mm -hmm. And he essentially rose to the top of organized crime because he was getting recognition for how brutal he was. He caused a lot of fear in others. And by doing that, he gained a lot of power. And at that time, the social climate, there were a lot of immigrants coming from Asia. And Chinatown was just building at that time and growing. So there were a lot of young men that were trying to survive. And this seemed to be the path, path of least resistance when you're an immigrant and you don't have many resources and you need to provide for yourself and perhaps even a family. So I think that his reach went beyond Boston. It probably went into New York as well as Canada. When he goes on the run, he goes to Canada to escape the authorities, but not to stay stagnant by any means. He was constantly creating gangs and means of you know, gaining power and money through organized crime. And you mentioned you were bouncing back and forth from the U.S. to Canada. How mm -hmm. old were you at this time? Yeah, I was about five. They initially went without me. They left me with my dad's parents and they left on their own thinking it was probably too dangerous to take me. Then they came back from Canada for me. And when they decided to go back and forth, it was very important for my dad to stay mobile so that he didn't get caught. They decided to bring me with them then. How did it end? How did you get out of that environment? 
it ultimately ends with my father going to prison. Mm -hmm. That was in a lot of ways brought us peace and it made the decision for us and it gave us freedom as he was being sentenced. Mm. Can you ever stop looking over your shoulder? Do you think that <clears throat> there's still danger around when you were growing older after that happened? How safe were you guys after that? Afterwards, I did feel a sense of danger, actually. I don't write about this in the book, but my mom moves on and remarries and we move to a different part of Massachusetts and we start from a clean slate, if you will. But my father still wanted to know where we were and he was obsessed with it because he had lost a sense of control. Mm -hmm. He was always asking my cousins to call the house and say, ask me, where do you guys live now? What's your address? I'm going to call it this time. You have to let me know. And I always had to make excuses as to why I couldn't tell them that information. I would say it's a new area. I don't know it. I don't know our address yet. <laughs> I was playing dumb. And then they're like, well, we're going to call back at this time. Your dad wants to know who this guy is where you guys are living now. And I would pretend I was sleeping or I would let the phone ring to voicemail knowing that they wouldn't leave anything or I'd hang up on it. So there was a sense of danger for a few years and that eventually faded out, fortunately. Now I don't feel a sense that I'm paranoid or looking over my shoulder. I feel free. I think that when I wrote the book, there was something in the back of my mind that recognized that my father could still have enemies out there. And now they would know that I was his daughter. But I didn't let that fear stop me. Yeah. <clears throat> why medical school and why critical care? Medical school, because it was secure, it was stable. It was a profession that I enjoyed because it gave me cerebral invigoration. It gave me a pathway to leadership. It's a privilege to be a practicing physician. And it's always going to be something that is a reminder to my mother that she did a good job, mm. right? There's no qualms about it. My daughter's a doctor. Throughout everything that we went through, the struggles, the poverty, the abuse, the instability, the chaos, that will always be a reminder for her that she did a good job. So that was one, one reason that I became a doctor and went into medicine. And then once I got into it, I really, really loved anesthesiology. There is an instant sense of gratification. You know, it's a very high acuity, fast paced environment. I like that. I like to push the medication and see how it works, understand the pharmacology and the physiology right before my eyes. Uh, I like the fact that I can, br that, that is my purpose now. I bring stability to a patient. You know, I get you off to sleep. I make sure you survive and stay safe under anesthesia through your surgery. I limit your pain and I make a smooth transition to wake up as if nothing happened. And that's now my responsibility. And that's something I've been searching for my entire life, stability. And now wow. I'm lucky enough where I can offer it to my patients. And the same thing in critical care. The first intensivists in the critical care were anesthesiologists because a lot of the, the things we practice in the operating room carries over into the ICU. Um, so definitely went into critical care to become a better anesthesiologist. And critical care also allowed me to help bridge the misunderstanding or gap between the operating room and the rest of medicine in the hospital, because it's a difficult area to understand if you don't work there. And I sometimes people don't have an appreciation for anesthesiologists because they don't understand it, not because of anything else. And you don't remember them, right? You see them for five or 10 minutes and then <laughs> you don't see them again. <laughs> but it was my way of shining light on that field as well. 
I think you appreciate them at that moment, especially with their bedside manner and how they put you under because you're scared to death. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've heard that. <laughs> you never wanted kids. Now you have four. What the heck happened? <laughs> no, I met my husband. <laughs> I never wanted kids because I think I grew up too fast. And I took a lot of responsibility in taking care of my little sister and brother. And having children wasn't appealing to me for a long time. But, you know, around my late 20s and early 30s, I met my husband and he comes from a big family and it changed everything. I wanted to have all his babies. I want to have more of his babies. <laughs> <laughs> and you just gave birth to your third child. And what was it at that moment that you decided to lock yourself away and write the book? That was also a credit to my husband. It was his idea. I was writing during COVID when there was not much to do. So after the kids went down, I would set aside a few hours to write. And when I was brave enough to let my husband read it, he really believed in the story and that I had to get it out and have it published. And this was going to be my legacy and it was going to be in writing for my children. We planned that. We planned that he would take one month paternity leave. I would take three months maternity leave. And seeing that we don't have a lot of time off together, we booked, we booked an Airbnb for three weeks. And after I gave birth, I gave the baby and the two under two handed him off to my husband. And I went and I finished the book. I guess that helped that you it already was. had a couple of kids, so you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. If it was your first and, and child, it would probably be different, right? <laughs> it would absolutely be different. Yeah. It was the perfect timing of things where we had the opportunity of time off together and we were able to plan because we were, we both agreed to do this. So we hired a night nanny. We made sure the older two were enrolled in daycare so that it wouldn't be so overwhelming for my husband. It really sounds like with your story, you need to find someone to option it for a movie too. <laughs> have you ever I thought about it? <laughs> I have thought about it plenty. I, that is the ultimate goal for it to be created into a movie. I wrote the book in a way that it would seem like a movie. I wrote a lot of dialogue. I purposely didn't delve too much into like the emotion or the reflection. I wanted to avoid being like a diary mm -hmm. because when you watch a movie, you just see action, body language, you hear the dialogue and you as the audience and as my readers, you can come to your own conclusions from that. So I wrote the book intentionally to hopefully transform it into a movie. Oh, cool. Yeah. How has releasing this story to the world helped you heal from this crazy back backstory? I'm not sure. The release of it helped. I think the writing part of it was the most powerful part in healing. The, it was a cathartic transformation. You know, it helped me reflect, gain perspective, and thus like a deep sense of gratification. When I go back and I dissect the experience, the emotions, I peel back the layers, I reassess that relationship, the dynamic of the interactions and the exchanges, it gave meaning to experience that I would maybe otherwise just overlook and not think twice about with each edit, with each read. And then when I finally released it, it liberalized me. I hid those stories away for so long. But in order to write and release the book, I had to go back and delve into these memories that I spent my entire life trying to forget, essentially, mm -hmm. trying to avoid. Because I was afraid of what it would do to me. So now it feels like freedom. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And the more you tell your story, the, the lighter the load, right? 
Yeah, it's just, this is who I am. I'm proud of it. I can walk in my purpose. I no longer have to sugarcoat or silence any part of me. And that's a great feeling. You and your husband both had immigrant parents. Can you describe what it's like to be in the middle of the diaspora, meaning your parents, at one end, and second-generation citizens, your children, at the other end? <laughs> there is a huge difference. And we talk about this all the time. A huge part of why I think that my husband and I are do well, have found success and happiness is because we did see what our parents went through. And then we went through similar experiences as minorities in America and the same type of struggles. Now my kids, we've been lucky enough where we've created a future for them. We've set up a family dynamic where they, as far as I can see, won't be struggling too much in the sense of like finances, education, opportunity. So in just two generations, there will be an, an extreme spectrum of what their experience growing up in America is. And we're lucky, but this is, you know, another reason why I had to write the book. Mm. They won't go through the same things, but it's important to know what I went through, their dad went through, their grandparents, and understand that there is resilience in their past. There's grit in their blood and hopefully give them a sense of appreciation. What lessons did your childhood teach you that help you today? So I would say... <laughs> I redirected a lot of the trauma into other vices, if you would say. For example, I read a lot. I read a lot to escape the reality of my everyday. And then I focused a lot on school and the schedule and education when I had the opportunity to do it. And I was really into math because I felt like perhaps I could I had control over the problem solving part and if I did everything exactly I was supposed to I would always reach the same answer the same outcome uh, so for me I carry that if things are stressful in my life I focus that energy into something productive some that is my coping mechanism now so I don't get stressed, one, because I have perspective and there's very little that can stress me out now <laughs> after what I've gone through. And, <laughs> and two, I can look at it for what it is and refocus all of my energy into something productive. So that's something that I've carried over into my adult life. The other thing is I have found a lot of value in self-talk, positive self-talk, which at the time, I didn't even realize what's happening, <laughs> but I would essentially say, I'm going to be just fine. <laughs> you know, I'm going to survive. I'm going to get through this and we will be okay. And now I do that all the time <laughs> you, it, through stressful situations or if I'm under a lot of pressure, I use a lot of positive self-talk throughout my day. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for being a guest on the show, Felicia. It was so Thank wonderful. You. Such Thank an interesting story. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate you so much.